Now, it would be easy to say our oh, last speaker tonight, Hannah Sell, needs no introduction. However, I do think it's important to flag up the huge role that Hannah Sell does play in the Socialist Party. Hannah, I think, was only 17 when she was a member of the National Executive Committee on the Labour Party. She doesn't look that much older now. Yeah. <laughs> and if you look up Hannah's name on the Socialist Party website, on Socialism Today or on the CWI's website, you'll find an array of excellent articles that are written by Hannah. Also, a book, Socialism in the 21st Century, in my opinion, is a must-have book for socialists. So please give a big welcome to the Socialist Party Deputy General Secretary, Hannah Sell. Okay, thank you, Elaine, for that slightly over-the-top introduction. Um, and before you travel home, I've got a very few minutes to try and draw together not just the main strands from this very good rally that we've had now, but from the whole weekend. A weekend which I think in many ways has been one of the very best socialism events we've ever had. Now, it's, an <laughs> it's an impossible task, but in my personal view, the very best thing about this weekend has been the magnificent enthusiasm and determination of all of you that have attended socialism. And that is summed up better than I can put it in words in the total of last night's Fighting Fund collection. We raised £29,915. <laughs> we've ever had at socialism it is obviously very close to 30,000 so as well as donating to the Greek section buying their material on the way out if you want to put in a little bit more to get us over the 30,000 that would be a fantastic end to the weekend but I think the enthusiasm shown in that appeal really reflects political developments that are taking place in Britain summed up by the slogan of this year's socialism, socialism is back. Of course, for us, it never went away. But for the capitalist class, they really did hope that socialism had gone away. The editor of the Daily Telegraph, when Jeremy Corbyn was on the verge of being elected, wrote an article where he said, from the 1990s onwards, we thought that the free market counter-revolution had finally killed off socialism. That is what they believed and hoped. And he went on to say that now to his horror, the election of Jeremy Corbyn meant that it was becoming acceptable again to call for nationalizing vast swathes of industry. He's right, but Jeremy Corbyn's election is only the beginning. As we have said throughout this weekend, it was not some unlikely accident. The form that Jeremy Corbyn's election took might have been unexpected, but the idea that there are millions of people, working class people, but also increasingly middle class people traditionally, like the junior doctors, who can see no future under capitalism and are looking for an alternative, that has been shown with Jeremy Corbyn in Britain, just as it's been shown with Bernie Sanders and Sharma Sawant in the US, with events in Greece, in Portugal, and so on. Here, it's found an outlet with Jeremy Corbyn's election, and there's no doubt a self-confessed socialist becoming the leader of the Labour Party is a real step forward. And the Socialist Party will do all we can to extend and consolidate that victory. But the best form of assistance is not simply cheerleading. That actually is a dereliction of duty. We have to put forward what we think is necessary to consolidate that victory. And has, as has already been said on this platform and last night, in our view, for the unaffiliated unions to vote at this stage to reaffiliate to the Labour Party would mean handing over 
their cash to the people, the right-wing Labour Party machine that have suspended Andrew Fisher and getting virtually no influence in return. Far better to use their funds to help build the anti-austerity movement and to support Jeremy Corbyn. And we also have to give a warning. There is nothing, no compromise, no concession that will reconcile the Labour right to Corbynism. The vicious civil war that is taking place in the Labour Party, that other speakers have referred to, Tristan Hunt and the rest of them, the shadow, shadow cabinet, are back to the hilt by the capitalist class, by the Tory party, by the right-wing media, and they are determined to get their party back. And being nice is a good thing, but you're not going to win by turning the other cheek. We understand the desire for unity. We want the maximum possible unity, but it has to be unity in the interests of the working class and against austerity. When Jeremy Corbyn said he wanted to make it crystal clear that he did not support mandatory reselection, in our view, that was a serious mistake. Let's be clear, MPs who vote for war, MPs who abstain on tax credits, MPs who say that the snoopers charter is a very good thing, they should face reselection. They do not represent the interests of the world. selection, saying, oh, well, then it's just the Selectariat. It's a few Labour Party members getting to decide. Well, actually, we think if you're representing a party, the members of that party should have a democratic right to decide. But we go beyond that as well, because we don't just support reselection within the Labour Party. We call for a real right of recall for MPs. Say, for example, a third of a, 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 the people in a constituency, the electors, are unhappy with their MPs' performance, don't agree with them voting for cuts and so on, they should have the right to force a by-election and those people stand on their own. But to win the fight against the right, to win the battle for the reselection of MPs and so on, or for councillors who are evicting people for not paying their bedroom tax. That requires mobilising and developing the anti-austerity movement from outside the Labour Party in the main, which thrust Jeremy Corbyn into power. And to do that effectively, it is absolutely essential. I know this has been said time and time again this weekend, but there can be no step back from the policies, a very modest programme actually, on which Jeremy Corbyn was elected. The young people who signed up to vote for Jeremy Corbyn did not do so out of loyalty to some abstract Labour Party. On the contrary, they did it because they saw a candidate who was standing for £10 an hour for mass council house building, for free education and a student grant. Any retreat on those policies, there is a danger that those people are demoralised and immobilised. And beyond that, there is the possibility of a Jeremy Corbyn's anti-austerity Labour Party winning broader sections of the working class. Workers who've abandoned Labour because they rightly saw that it had abandoned them. UKIP got four million votes in the general election. The other Labour Party leadership candidates drew the conclusion that meant they had to pander further to the right. And yet who was the most popular? of the Labour leader candidates amongst UKIP voters. Jeremy Corbyn, the man who left his victory celebration to go and attend the refugees' demonstration. Because workers who had abandoned Labour for UKIP could be won back on the basis of nationalising the railways, nationalising the energy companies, policies that they overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly support. It's a good start, that position, amongst UKIP voters that Jeremy Corbyn was able to win. But it's not guaranteed that it will continue. It depends on building a firm anti-austerity position. It will be interesting to see what happens in the Oldham by-election where unfortunately the candidate for Labour for the seat is the leader of the Labour Council who has carried out huge cuts in public services. Let's see what vote UKIP gets in that by-election. We will do everything we can to ensure that Jeremy's victory is the first step to the establishment of a mass anti-austerity party. In the battle against the right, we are 110% with the Corbynistas, including 
As Peter said at the rally yesterday, being prepared to join a Labour Party organised on a federal basis that could bring together all of the different anti-austerity forces. But at the same time, we also, as we have this weekend, want a discussion on how it is possible to build a party that can actually end austerity. Greece shows in tragic and graphic detail that being popular, becoming a leader of a party, even winning an election is not enough. What is necessary is being prepared to break with capitalism and to build a mass movement for socialist policies. I saw John McDonnell on the TV in one of his first interviews as Shadow Chancellor and he was asked, do you want to abolish capitalism? And his answer was, yes, we already are, bit by bit. Now, on the one hand, that was a huge step forward. After all, Gordon Brown said not only that he wanted to keep capitalism, but he perfected it and abolished boom and bust. Miliband talked about responsible capitalism, this mythical and non-existing beast. And so, you know, to be anti-capitalism is a step, anti-capitalist is a step forward. And we welcome every bit of capitalism that we manage to abolish under this system, if you like. Every reform that can be won under capitalism. In fact, Marxists, Trotskyists, a term that is becoming popular again, we are the most effective and the hardest fighters for reforms and against counter-reforms. Who can doubt that when you've seen the $15 an hour battle in Seattle or the battle against water charges in Ireland that you heard last night? What makes us the most effective reformists, if you like? It is because we do not accept the logic of the capitalist system and we are confident in the capacity of the working class to struggle. I personally, I've been, it's been referred to me being on the Labour Party NEC in my youth, but I do personally remember when it really came home to me the difference between our approach and Marxist approach and many others on the left. I was on the NEC of the Labour Party when the right were in the ascendancy. In fact, I was the last representative of the youth section because the only way they could get rid of the influence of militant in the Labour Party Young Socialists was by shutting the whole thing down, which is what they did at the end of my, uh, at the end, uh, of my term. There were three other lefts on the NEC, and they included Tony Benn, who was the most consistently left and in defence of the working class and against the witch hunts and so on. This was at the time when the battle against the poll tax was just beginning in Scotland. It hadn't yet been implemented in England and Wales. Expulsions were taking place against militant supporters from the Labour Party in Scotland because they were organising mass non-payment. Tony Benn trenchantly defended those people against expulsion, as did the other uh, uh, two left-wingers. He also said that he personally would not be paying his poll tax when it came in. But he also argued again and again that he could not call on anybody else not to pay their poll tax because to do so would be putting working class people in a position where they might be facing the courts, it would be wrong and so on. Now in the event when mass non-payment developed, he fully supported it. But it was us that had the foresight to say, many people will not be able to pay. Many more will choose not to pay. We can organise a mass movement as we did that succeeded in defeating the poll tax and bringing down Thatcher. So we have a proven record of being effective reformists. But at the same time, you can't abolish capitalism bit by bit. This is a system based on the exploitation of the majority, the working class, for the profits of a few, the capitalists. And they will never allow us to gradually dismantle their system. Any reforms we win, they take back when they get the opportunity. What is austerity? if it's not the capitalist class attempting to take back all of the reforms that our parents and our grandparents won in the National Health Service, the right to a pension, and so on. 21st century capitalism is taking away even the few crumbs that we won in the past. That doesn't mean we can't win victories. We can and we will. This trade union bill that is going through Parliament at a certain stage will be swept aside by a mass movement of the working class. But at the same time, to permanently win the minimum requirements for a civilised existence, a decent job with a living wage, free education, a secure home, 
the right to have a pension and retire while you still got breath in your body. Those things, even in a rich country like Britain, will not be won on the basis of capitalism. So it does require, as the Telegraph are beginning to panic about, nationalisation of huge swathes of industry. We would say it requires nationalisation of the commanding heights, the major corporations and banks that dominate the economy under democratic working class control so we can begin to build a socialist society that stands in the interests of the majority and abolishes forever the misery that capitalism means so that in Britain there are a million families relying on food banks and yet at the same time in the four weeks of Jeremy Corbyn's election campaign alone the richest thousand people in this country got 2.3 billion pounds richer that is enough money to feed every one of those families not from food banks but with proper buying whatever they want from Tesco or whatever for at least two years. Four weeks they made that much extra money, but to get rid of that gigantic inequality, to harness that wealth for the benefit of the majority, that means fighting for socialism. So I would say to all of you here, if you haven't already, you should join the struggle for socialism. We are the first wave. There are going to be many more, hundreds, thousands, millions at a certain stage, joining the struggle for a new society. But you want to be in the first wave. Join us in building socialist ideas. Join the Socialist Party, and I hope you've enjoyed the weekend.